took a popular traffic app to stay the obvious. Metro Manila has the worst traffic on earth. We have the longest commuting time from home to the office and back. And what used to be called Highway 54 may as well be called Parking Lot 54. How do we decongest Metro Manila? And what is the answer to Carmageddon? Good evening, I am Tony Abad and this is Political Capital. Our guest tonight, President Aquino's chief troubleshooters, the man nominated by every business organization to be the new traffic czar, Cabinet Secretary Rene Almendras, and Chief Superintendent Arnold Gunacao, director of the PNP Highway Patrol Group. In one short sentence, tell us why is traffic so bad in Metro Manila? From January to June of 2015, Tony, the estimate at least 60,000 new vehicles were bought and is being used in Metro Manila. The car dealers tell us that the second half of the year is usually a better time for them, so we can expect another 60,000 uh, in the second half or at the very least, uh, it's going to be more than 60,000. Okay. So too many vehicles entering well, the, the market. It, it's happened to... Every economy in Asia that had a, had a growth spur, mm -hmm. sort of. Um, Thailand had it, uh, Malaysia had it, Kuala Lumpur had it. I, I don't mean to push the idea, but things have really been good for the economy. The, the middle class has both expanded and deepened as a, as a matter of income, so the affordability of vehicles has significantly improved. So if EDSA is capable of 144,000, why is it congested? Because there's over 300,000 vehicles that do EDSA every day. That explains the congestion. That's why we targeted EDSA. We said, um, and I know we're being criticized on why we're only staying in EDSA, but you know, you have, the Metro Manila traffic is a complex, both horizontally and vertically complex problem. And we said the only way to start solving a significantly complex problem is to focus, and we said, Let's start with a main thoroughfare. That's main, um, in the development world, we used to call it the spine road. So the pinaka spine road of Metro Manila is, is EDSA. EDSA. Somebody told me, I do not know what the basis for it is, that between 60 to 70% of the 13 million or 12 million nighttime population uh, of Metro Manila touches EDSA every day. By touch, you mean you cross, cross it, you yeah. run on it or at a certain point in time, you go in and out of it. So, General, what, what is the situation in terms of enforcement? As of now, it is really our uh, orders to our policemen to see to it that we really enforce the traffic laws because what we have observed in other places where there is any strict enforcement of laws, particularly traffic of laws, the drivers become well-disciplined. The drivers become orderly. So, so they just have to know that they have there's just, a real consequence. Yes, uh, as what we have said, we have to, to stand firm and have that politi so-called political will to enforce the law. Okay. How about the, I guess, the old, um, old stories about uh, it's easy to talk your way out of uh, a violation with, uh, with the traffic police or with, with traffic enforcers. Uh, how do you control that type of, uh, or avoid that type of a situation? Uh, we introduced the so-called 30 second uh, apprehension rule yes. wherein uh, once the driver violated the traffic law the traffic enforce, enforcer will just stop the bus or that uh, motor vehicle and then inform the driver about his violations and then get the driver's license issue a ticket and then release him there is no other conversation so no, no more discussion no more discussion and that, that, i encourage our uh, commuters or the motorists to take a video or picture of any conversation if there are any i'm curious about the bus lane concept we're going to make edsa bus friendly so that when we put the delineators so the three lanes are for private vehicles yes the two lanes are for buses and we are going to make the bus moves a lot faster so much so that if you are going to makati and you're all alone it's a lot better for you to go to a mall where you will board one of our new premium buses, which will be available when, when we launch this program. Uh, park your car, take the bus. You will get to Makati faster than if you drove the car yourself. 
and you don't have to pay parking in Makati. And, and economically, it makes a lot more sense. But it will also have to be based on a schedule, so people these can buses, predict where... These buses will be running on fixed schedules. Okay. There is even going to be an app. You can even book a reservation okay. on... And these are private buses? buses? Private okay. buses. Um, there are so many re learnings here, Tony. You know, like everybody thought that the main volume of population transfer is from north to south. To south. It's not. It's northeast to south. Northeast. That is why the traffic problem of the buses only start in Kamuning. Okay. Because the volume of people that move to Makati actually comes from Fairview through Commonwealth. Okay. Actually, the solution in EDSA is segment by segment, okay. that, and that's what we did. The first situation which we were able to resolve is the situation in Balintawak, wherein there are a lot of vendors, there are a lot of uh, delivery trucks. Everybody right. said it couldn't be done, but General Gunakao and the... Uh, PDs and the rest of the yes. and the Quezon City government made it happen. The next situation that we encountered is that in Trinoma area, wherein there, yes. there was a U-turn slot. And just like in That's Balintawak, right. it is supposed to be a two-lane U-turn slot, but it became a four-lane U-turn slot. And there's only one lane left for motor vehicles flying southbound. So we were able to resolve that. Why is it that, uh, and these are usually uh, local government traffic enforcers, yes. who turn off traffic, and manually do. Lights and manually try to manage the traffic, and it, it always tends uh, tends to become worse. Uh, from my at least from my point of view, yes. uh, is there any move to to address that that behavior of, of traffic enforcers? Actually, the high patrol is already going out of Edsa to okay. res to resolve those problems. So I think it's better to just leave the traffic lights on. And, and here, here's where <laughs> I defend General Gunakao because he's got to be on the streets. Let's take an, a clear example, and I'm going to make. I'm going to say a statement that I know may be controversial to some people. Take Shaw Boulevard. Okay. It is a major choke point today. We have a number of second count for the true traffic on EDSA. And there's an exactly X number of seconds for Shaw Boulevard turning into EDSA. You can't believe it, but you have more time given to vehicles along Shaw than to EDSA. Yes. So we're living with that right now because the reality is there. But here's the bigger problem on Shaw Boulevard. How many traffic agencies control traffic in Shaw Boulevard? I'll tell you how many. San Juan has traffic enforcers. Mandaluyong has traffic enforcers. When you cross Edsa, when you cross, <laughs> when you cross Edsa, when you go down, there's Barangay San Antonio's traffic enforcers and security guards who's controlling vehicles entering Shaw Boulevard from San Antonio. You go a few more meters, then you have Bar Barrio Capitolio, who also has their own agenda of getting people out. Not to mention what happens when I cross to the passing side and then the traffic enforcers are there. So that's when we decided we're going to involve even the local governments. And I'm grateful the local governments okay. are there. If you were named the, I don't know, the EDSA dictator and nobody could really question your moves, no? in, 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 what would you do about EDSA? Is there any specific <laughs> wish that you would have... Uh, I'm so glad you're asking him that enough. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we, we just uh, implement the basics. Uh, first and foremost, I firmly believe that the self-discipline of the drivers is the number one requirement. Okay. Because if everyone is have that self-discipline, even if there are no enforcers around, they should follow the traffic rules. And second, there should be a reorientation of the drivers because as I was uh, telling to my friends, 90% of the drivers have, did not undergo any formal driving lessons. That's another issue. And that is the reason why I will be recommending to the uh, Land Transportation Office to require to every driver who intends to renew his license to undergo at least a one-hour orientation, reorientation on the traffic rules and regulations. When we come back, the HPG in EDSA, are they going to be manning the traffic for the long haul? Let's find out. You are still with Political Capital. And this is Tony Abad. Secretary Almendras, you were previously assigned to solve the port congestion problem. What lessons do you bring from that experience? And I think that was what cursed you with this, <laughs> with this assignment. One of the things about the port problem, it's very similar to EDSA again. It's not one problem. It's a big problem composed of a series of smaller problems. And in solving the port problem, I had to solve one portion at a time. 
I would meet with the truck drivers, mm -hmm. I would meet with the port operators, container ownership, and so on and so forth. Not to mention the, the squabble among these groups. So. Yes. And, and that's what we decided we were going to bring to EDSA. And that's why the solutions, we only had six days to prepare for EDSA launching. We met on a Tuesday, we launched on a Monday. And some people were actually cautioning me and said, Sec, uh, you may want to tone it down, but uh, General Marquez, myself, and General Gunaka were so sure of what we wanted to do. And, and so it made solution, it made driving the solution faster. That's uh, and essentially what I'm saying is there was a bit more confidence in me coming out of the port congestion problem. Because port congestion was also a traffic problem. Yeah. The general seems to be a never-ending issue. I mean, uh, you know, we, we get to travel and, you, you know, you have very de well-defined bus, bus waiting areas and you wait for the bus and, and it comes. And just that, that area. But here it's uh, almost unbelievable. Uh, what's, what would be the solution for this? Based on the recommendation of our uh, so-called academics, uh, we really need to de designate certain bus stops and make it a point that there will just be a single entry and exit on that particular area. Mm -hmm. So you have to put barricades and then the, you make it a point that the loading station should be elevated so that the commuters can just load the buses or uh, put the, the doors higher so that those individuals who are not on those loading bays cannot just load the, the buses. Yes. General, aside from being armed, what is the, essentially the difference between uh, the HPG and the MMDA before? Yeah, the, the ASPG has that semblance of authority, and which the MMDA traffic enforcers do not have. Yes. In fact, uh, when the drivers resist the giving of tickets or resist or do not give the, the driver's license to the traffic enforcers of the MMDA, they cannot do anything. Unlike the highway patrol group, they have that semblance of authority and they, they do have that police power so that when the driver uh, do not like or refuse to give his driver's license to the highway patrol group, since the highway patrol group enforce a law, and he can say, oh, if you do not give your driver's license, I can arrest you for uh, resisting arrest or for violating a certain law. Uh, Secretary, you're a former top executive of Ayala and Aboitis. Uh, how, do you, how do you use that experience, I mean, now with, with the traffic and maybe even with the port congestion uh, problem? I've been, I've been a CEO since I was 37 years old. But there's nothing prepares you for the kind of problems that you will see in government. For the simple reason that if you're in the private sector, you, are, you have the tools, the resources, and most of all, you are empowered to put the solutions. In government, it's a bit more challenging. Uh, there are much more complex relationships that need to be managed. <laughs> well, from your point of view, at least for traffic, what would be your wish? No, I, of, uh, I honestly, government, I honestly uh, think that we can make EDSA work. Okay. We need everybody's cooperation. It's not about driving your car anymore. You should think about what is the fastest way to get from point A to point B in an, in an acceptable convenience factor. And we are going to try to deliver that. And that's why we want to do the express bus system. We want to do the premium bus service. Yes. And we are going to... Remember, when we started solving this problem, we made it very clear. I'm sorry, Da. This is probably what I bring in from the private sector. In, you understand the problem, and then you define the objective. Yes. So the solution was, EDSA is congested. The strategy is, so the, strate the strategy statement is, increase people throughput. That was very clear among yes. all the government agencies. It's not about increasing the number of cars, because I cannot build another EDSA. Or if I, or you know, it's going to take a tremendously long time and resource to do that. So the intention is, with what we have, we need to increase the flow and ability of people to move there, and we are going to achieve that. When we come back, the upcoming Apex Summit, the JICA study, and the other issues affecting Metro Manila traffic. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're still with Political Capital and still with Secretary Almendras and General Arnold Gunacao of the HPG. The APEC Leaders Meeting is coming. It's supposed to be this November 18 and 19 and it's foreseen to be a major source of headache in terms of traffic and yes. other issues. 
What are the plans to, to uh, alleviate this or to address this problem? We have been conducting a lot of contingency planning as far as APEC is concerned. And there is a suggestion now that uh, during APEC, we will come out with the so-called APEC lane okay. to accommodate this uh, head of states who will be attending this uh, APEC. There are supposed to be two lanes dedicated for this APEC lanes, but there are a lot of, of uh, disagreements as far as these lanes are concerned. Aside from these uh, special lanes, uh, what other, I guess, special measures uh, are you uh, we already have, putting in place? Yes, we already have uh, security packages for these delegates. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, security measures being implemented for the APEC. In fact, uh, even including the buildings of these delegates are uh, secured as yeah. far as the PNP is concerned. We as a country have the rare opportunity of hosting one of the world's greatest gatherings. In, in sheer magnitude, you have 21 heads of states, head of economies coming. Um, even when Russia hosted it, they had some very drastic initiatives. Yes. They literally built a city to do it. Uh, in Bali, they built a whole new network on top of the ocean just to, just to make it work. Um, we are in a mode wherein it's not as if we're going to see total chaos in the streets. No. Um, there will be movements. There will be a lot of movements, as a matter of fact. But there's, there's a lot of uh, initiative having... There's a lot of effort have... A lot of effort have been put in place to handle the processes that are required in, in running the, the leaders retreat. Um, there will be inconvenience, mm -hmm. but we are trying our very best to make sure there is no actual absolute stoppage because life has to go on. People need to move from one place to the other. So we're, General Gunakao have been, and I have been talking about this, we're proposing some measures. And I, I have talked to a few people who are directly involved in the in the APEC preparation about that. Now you have to understand, you Closures have 21 heads of state. You have the President of the United States, the Prime Ministers, the heads of states of China, Russia, and all of them are coming with their security contingents. And it's, you know, I was worried about parking space, not yes. for cars, but for airplanes. Because it's <laughs> no joke when you have... Yes. Uh, then, then there are requests, there are demands, like certain countries require that their airplane for their president must be within X minutes and so on and so forth. So it's, it's quite a feat to do this. This is a wonderful way for the Filipino nation to show the world that, you know, we can make things work. Yeah. And well, on this issue, uh, sir, would you say that today we are ready for, for receiving the APEC uh, leaders? Yes, after all those meetings, after all those contingency plans that we have, we are ready to receive these mm -hmm. delegates. Okay, let's look at the, the long term, no? um, Secretary. 2014, the government approved a meg, uh, Mega Manila Transport, Transport Infrastructure, Infrastructure Plan, Plan. No? Uh, which is supposedly based on a JICA study. Which part of this roadmap has already been implemented? The connector roads, the elevated highways that will connect North Luzon and S Southern Luzon okay. is happening. Uh, C6 uh, envisioned originally to run along the coastline will shift to the Megadike project, which is a better solution. Okay. Uh, there are a few challenges. This whole infra is, is already being planned. There are people working on it. The, well, the connector roads need to happen, and then additional mass transit capacity. What about alternative systems of transport, like rail, you know, high-speed rails or um, commuter rails? MRT, or? the light rails are going to be expanded. There's a line six approved already, seven. Uh, BRT is being studied. Uh, has been approved for Quezon Boulevard and Co Commonwealth okay. until the Commonwealth uh, LRT is put in place. Okay. So this is the same thing that they're implementing in Metro Cebu, yeah. this BRT. Mm -hmm. And you, you do recommend it also for, yes. for Metro um, BRT is faster to do than LRT. I think the study that I, that I alluded to, the JICA study, said that without any intervention, the traffic cost is about... Uh, is this correct? Billion. 24 billion. How... How do you see this changing with, with the, the current set of interventions in terms of uh, figures? Efficiency cost is still going to be there until we can start moving, but it also requires about ability to move. There's this argument of who gets priority in road, people or goods. Remember, there was a time when some mayors wanted to completely ban trucks on their streets. And I went back okay. to them. I was solving the congestion problem yeah. in the port. I went back to them and said, but how are you going to feed your population if you're not going to allow <laughs> yes, trucks? Right. So it's, it's about 
you have a finite resource. You need to find a way to, res to share that resource with the different priorities. So when people are sleeping, that's the best time to move your goods. That's why you let trucks go in at night and so on and so forth, right? So ideally, the, the, the solutions are both infra, hard, yes. and there are soft, like we're proposing uh, more efficient bus systems, premium bus systems. You know, we're trying to encourage people, you don't have to drive your car, ride a bus. Um, if in New York, even the richest, most affluent, powerful people of New York ride the subway because it's a lot faster than driving a car on, on Manhattan, right? Yes, yes. I mean, you, you see movie stars and you see the mayor yeah, of New York picking. walking on. So the dream is, yes, we will all be riding mass transit. What is your message to investors, people who are looking from the outside world saying, I want to invest in the Philippines, but I'm worried about that place called Metro Manila. These problems are not new, they're common. Mm -hmm. in, a, in an economy which is uh, expanding, there is these challenges. The key is we want to see that you guys are working on a solution. And so far, I think we've been able to convince them that we are working on solutions. Mm -hmm. Now, the sad thing is if they if we do not admit that there is a problem, then we cannot come up with a solution. We had to go through the, through, the, through the asking of what is the problem and defining the problem so we can put the solutions in place. Metro Manila has been described as the gates of hell. Its commuters and motorists suffer a sense of doom and frustration, facing an ever-increasing amount of time on the road, severely affecting their quality of life. Tonight, we have heard some solutions that provide short-term relief. But in the end, it's about a metropolis well beyond its carrying capacity that requires a long-term solution not just for our convenience, but for our survival. The real source of hope for Metro Manila is its decongestion in a very radical way. We must move government, industry, and all illegal settlers out and build new cities that are livable and sustainable. Only then can there be hope for those of us who are still trapped here in the gates of hell. This is Tony Abad for Political Capital. Thank you, and we'll see you again next week.